Welcome to GS Podcast number 93. It's going to be a good one. I have Ali A. Rizvi returning back to the show. Ali's a Pakistani-Canadian author. Been a big admirer of his writing for quite some time now, and various articles he's put out there. Um, last time he was on the podcast was August 2014, and he, um, he was right in the middle of putting this book together called The Atheist Muslim, which intrigued me and I was really looking forward to. Happily, it is now available, uh, and I've read it from cover to cover, and it, it's fantastic. It's um, it's the perfect blend of interesting personal experiences mixed with right up-to-date current topics, such as reform, such as the regressive left, and I think it's a very important, timely book, so I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, it's available now. I know Amazon are stocking it. I know there's an Audible version, which reminds me... As a listener of this podcast, you get a free 30-day subscription to Audible Services. Not only that, that means you get a free audiobook as well, which you can keep forever, even if you decide you don't want to go ahead with Audible Services. So my recommendation would be go and get The Atheist Muslim. Um, You can claim this by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash GS. And it also helps to support the show. It's great to have Ali back on the show again. Make sure you pick up a copy of the book. Make sure you send him some kind words and some love on Twitter. You can find him at Ali Amjad Rizvi. You can keep up to date on the podcast at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ali Rizvi back to the GS podcast. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me again. It's great to talk to you. You too. How's it going? It's going well. Um, you know, so far so good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I want you to cast your mind back to March. I just want to share a little experience I I had. Um, I took a little break in Rome. And, right. Um, yeah. I, I've had a tour of the Vatican booked and I thought, I've got a Christopher Hitchens t-shirt and I thought, I'm going to wear it around the Vatican. And then a few days leading up to the trip, I kind of talked myself out of it. I thought, you know, the time to fuck around is probably not in a foreign country. Um, So then I I arrive in Italy, check into my hotel, open my Facebook, and there is a big pitch review with like the largest grin ever stood (laughs) in front of the Vatican with the t-shirt on. If you could just share with me what that slogan was. Oh, it's the Richard Dawkins uh, t-shirt says, religion together, we will find a cure. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I, I wore it throughout the, the Vatican trip. And, and we, we connected a little bit while you were in, uh, we were both in Italy around the same time. Yeah, we and just missed each other, didn't we? That was a shame. Yeah, just a couple hours. Yeah, it was, uh, but, you know, it was a great time there. And we went there and um, it was in it's St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah. And I had the t-shirt there. So, um, you know, I, I thought I just had to do it. Uh, it was fun. It's, un- unfortunately, it's, just, it's not something that you can do in Mecca. Like that's, uh, <laughs> so... Kudos to and then credit goes to the Catholic Church for that. I never thought I'd be saying those words. Um, but, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, hopefully the world will change at some point. What a strange twist of fate that we almost bumped into each other at the Vatican, completely unplanned. Yeah, yeah that would have been great. Mm. Yeah. Did you get any reaction to that t shirt? Any sly glances? Yeah, there were sly glances for sure. I mean, whenever you do something like that, there's always sly glances. It was kind of interesting. Uh, compared to uh, well, it, you know the the uh, the LGBT, the Gay Pride Parade in Toronto, um, just a year prior to that, I'd gone in, and and here there's a sort of a downtown area where it's called you know Young and Dundas Street. It's called uh, Dundas Square, and uh, they usually have a lot of celebrities. It's kind of like a, sort of like Times Square in New York, and uh, there are a bunch of religious preachers who stand there on Gay Pride Day. 
and they uh, talk about how you know uh, just uh, homosex is evil, and you know God will throw all uh, gay people into hell, and you know all, all those kinds Standard. of things. <laughs> yeah, no, so they have the, they have those signs up, and I have this uh, this hoodie that, and this is you know I, I guess this is a part of me that I will never grow out of because I just enjoy it too much, and and the hoodie actually says. You know, too stupid for science, try religion. And uh, it says it very clearly. And I wore that hoodie and I posed with all of them. And I took, uh, I, I took photos again. And, um, you know, with the same smile. Yeah. And became a big yeah. So it's, you know, you got to do it. It's, uh, it's, it's such a beautiful use of your free expression, that, isn't it? it? It's right. And it's so funny to see them struggling. Like they've got these immensely hateful, discussing messages and signs that they're carrying but at the same time you know you show up and you know they read your t-shirt or your or your hoodie and, and they're like well no we we embrace you jesus loves you and i'm like okay all right so that's good so you're not gonna you know whack me upside the head while i'm do, taking this picture with you um so and and but in toronto the reaction is totally different you know people actually loved it people were coming around everybody's taking their own pictures of me um and sort of trolling them in that sense um, <laughs> Still the, the Vatican, limelight. Yeah, yeah, it was the Vatican is obviously different, but it was amazing. I mean, the Vatican is probably one of the most, um, you know, I mean, everybody talks about the Sistine Chapel and how surreal it is, and you know, having three rooms painted by Raphael, and and a, a lot of that was just um, it was incredible. Um, you know, I really, really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, they, apart from the trolling aspect, yeah, yeah. Um, I, did, I checked before. Uh, I dialed you in. The last time we spoke was last time you was on this show. Should I say was August two thousand fourteen, which just seems to have flown by. But we we spoke a little yeah. bit about your planned book, which I'm pleased to say is out now. That's the the atheist Muslim, and I, I absolutely loved it. I've, I've let you know that I think it's I think it's brilliant and a, an important book. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And I was wondering maybe before we touch upon the specifics of the book and get into that, maybe you can just share with people your background again and what your sort of Muslim upbringing was like. Well, um, I was born in Lahore, Pakistan. So Pakistan's like where I'm from uh, originally. Um, and uh, after that, I lived, my parents were both professors. So um, I lived in Tripoli, Libya, lived in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then I went back to Pakistan for um, a university uh, then after that, I came to Canada, and then I went to the U.S., lived there for five years, and I came back to Canada, and now I live in Canada again. So uh, until the age of 24, I had pretty much lived in Libya, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan for the most for most of my life, which is, those are three sort of very different Muslim-majority countries. All three of them are Muslim-majority, but culturally, um, you know, Libya is North African, uh, Saudi Arabia is sort of the heart of uh, Salafi fundamentalist um, Islam. And it's actually the birthplace of uh, Muhammad, the Quran, and and the religion it, itself. Uh, and then uh, Pakistan is a, a South Asian uh, country that came out of India, so different language, different culture, everything. Um, so th that was my experience growing up. Uh, and when that happens, I guess uh, religion is all around you all the time, and it plays a huge part in uh, how you grow up. Your relationships to others, um, you know, just a culture and society in general. So that's a ba that's basically my background. Otherwise, um, I am, uh, you know, I I do have, you know, I, I went down the science route educationally and professionally. So right now I work in medical communications. I am also a physician. I'm I specialize in pathology or cancer pathology, um, and uh, I also have a graduate degree in biochemistry. So I've done a lot of uh, basic science as well. So. That's yeah. I think that's pretty much it. That's where and a lot of that is discussed in the book, and you know how that played into a lot of the ideas that are presented in the book. Yeah, I mean, so the book's called "The Atheist Muslim" for a start, which some might find confusing. It almost seems like a contradiction in terms there. But what is it right. exactly you mean by the atheist Muslim? Well, the atheist Muslim. One of one of the things that I uh, very purposely wanted was for people to look at the title and say, you know, what does that mean? You know, to be confused by it or to actually think that it was an oxymoron because that actually gets the conversation going. And I've noticed this in the last couple of years. Um, but the, the atheist Muslim, there's many different aspects to it. One, one major thing is that I, I don't think at this point uh, the, the, these labels, like a, a lot of them are very narrow. 
Uh, I don't think Muslim, for instance, means necessarily uh, someone who follows uh, Islam to the letter and to the T. It's it's become almost an identity. And the main thesis of this book is really a discussion of about um, making that distinction between Islamic ideology, and that's a set of ideas, and Muslim identity, which is uh, based on human experience. So, you know, Islam is an idea, Muslims are people. Uh, so, um, and the one thing that's uh, really, a, a way to illustrate this actually that uh, uh, I discuss in the book as well is uh, an article that came out last year uh, in the Washington Post written by Fareed Zakaria, who's a you know very famous um, American journalist. Yeah. Uh, he's originally, he is originally from India and uh, he is a Muslim American. And he wrote an article saying, I am a Muslim, where he embraced the Muslim identity. Um, and then he went on to say that I am a non-practicing Muslim. I don't practice. My wife is Christian. I haven't raised my children as Muslims. Um, I haven't been to a mosque in decades. And his beliefs, his ideas on faith, he said, um, are somewhere between deism and agnosticism. He's like, but I still feel that I need to embrace the Muslim identity uh, because of what uh, he saw the Republican candidates doing um, in the election recently, when the way they were dividing people. And then he went on to say that uh, the, the reason that I'm outraged by the demagoguery and bigotry of Donald Trump is not because I'm Muslim, but because I'm American. So um, I, I had actually almost you know, completed the book uh, at that point. But when that happened, I realized that that's a perfect illustration of what I was trying to get at in the book. I mean, here's a man who does not um, believe in, uh, he's, I mean, he's saying he doesn't really believe in any of the ideological aspects. I mean, this is not a man who would take, look at the book and, you know, look at everything that it says in the Quran about infidels and think, okay, yeah, that's what I believe in. Like, absolutely not. Uh, but, and he's even saying that he, you know, varies between deism and agnosticism. But somehow, something made him go back and embrace the Muslim identity, right? And that is the definition of Muslim that um, I've tried to explore here. And that is the thing that actually causes a lot of confusion on both the left and the right. So right now what you have is uh, on the left, you know, people are saying if you criticize Islamic ideology, then that's bigotry against all Muslims. And on the right... What they're saying is, well, Islam has a lot of problems, it has a lot of violence in it. So if you're Muslim, um, then we need to profile you, we need to screen you, we need to even like ban you from the country, as Donald Trump said last year, and then later went back on. So, and, and both sides are actually conflating this idea of Islam um, as an idea and Muslims as people. So th this, this book is really about ideology versus identity and how to pry the two apart and how both of them uh, just work when it comes to the Muslim experience. So it's, uh, um, I mean, my agent, when he, uh, when I first pitched the book to him, I sent him the book proposal. He's like, initially I was baffled when I saw the title, <laughs> but after I read through the proposal, then it made complete sense. And, and that's what I would tell people. Like if you're baffled, if you're, if you're confused or, you know, hopefully intrigued by the title, um, go through the book and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Um, so I, I've got a suspicion we might steer towards a bit of criticism of Islam at some point in this conversation. So uh, to I'll switch, yeah, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. But I think just to switch things up a little bit, are there any sort of Islamic traditions uh, that you still find valuable, that you still like to participate in from a purely secular standpoint? Right. And uh, I, yes, there, there are. And that is, I guess, the Muslim part of me. I mean, there are, and I, I think you spoke about this last time, I, I, one of my favorite times of year is, is uh, the, the month of Ramadan. And this is the month of fasting. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's just, it's a pretty standard thing. It, it happens in a lot of religions, a whole fasting ritual. But um, my association with it as a kid is uh, just the when we break the fast um, at sunset, 
it's a social event. It's when families get together. So I have very fond memories of that family and friends getting together. You have parties, it's called iftar. So you have iftar parties. Um, and it's, it's just a very, uh, it's, it's almost like a festival. I still enjoy that to this day. I have very pleasant memories associated with it. Um, the holidays of Eid, I enjoy just like, you know, a lot of, uh, completely secular people enjoy, uh, Christmas. You know, I, I, I remember Richard Dawkins, uh, himself, uh, writing about how he's a cultural Christian and how he enjoys singing Christmas carols. And he actually, uh, if I remember correctly, he said that he, he finds the ones that are actually religious, uh, the Christmas carols that are religious, a lot nicer. And uh, he he likes them a lot more than the, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer aspects of it. So those, so those you know, the, the holidays and, the, and the, some of these traditions that are associated with fun and community and families and friends, everybody getting together, I, I definitely still participate in for sure. Um, it's, uh, you know, there are, there's a month of mourning, um, in, uh, for Shia Muslims. And I was raised in the Shia Muslim tradition called, uh, called Muharram. They commemorate the death of Hussein, who's a grandson of, of, uh, Muhammad. And during that time they have these, uh, sort of like musical, I guess, chants or, uh, they're, they're a lot like hymns where, uh, there is a, uh, a people sort of beat their chest to give it rhythm as a form of self-flagellation and they and they sing these beautiful tunes um that's a part of it those a lot of those melodies that's how i learned how to sing so i I also you know play in a band and that influenced a lot of uh what i do musically as well so so there are uh, those aspects that i still value um so yeah for sure absolutely do you um, incorporate the chest beating into any of your sets as of yet? Um, I have uh, a song uh, called Ptolemy. My band is called Detshire. They have a, we have a song called Ptolemy that was actually inspired by it. So the beat in that is um, I did get a bunch of people to come into the studio and uh, they got around a couple of microphones and they beat their chests <laughs> uh, to give the rhythm. And it sounds, it's got a very sort of very tribal um like groove to it it's a, it's it sounds really cool so but from but apart from uh, you know giving rhythm to something there are people who self flagellate with blades and they make themselves bleed and all of that i haven't done that in any studio as of late so yeah that wouldn't doesn't i wouldn't recommend that i don't think yeah um yeah it's it's probably a good thing to stay away from <laughs> luckily i think we're getting quite a lot of um literature on uh, about islam now that's looking at it through a, a critical lens and talking about reevaluating and re- re-examining islam's place in the world and i was wondering where with you sort of being right in the middle of this conversation did you think there was anything that wasn't really being brought up in this discussion that you just had to get into your book what, what sort of things do you think people weren't paying enough attention to in this discussion um I think that it was, uh, it, it is what I talked about earlier, it's this idea of differentiating Islam as an ideology from uh, Muslims as uh, as a people or, you know, Muslim as an identity. Um, you know, a lot of people who embrace uh, the Muslim identity uh, to, uh, I guess, maintain uh, some sense of themselves, you know, because that's what sort of defined them. That's their history. That's their family. That's their ancestry. That's their heritage. Um, and uh, they, the beliefs are actually secondary to them. I mean, even if they won't admit it. Um, and, and I think that that differentiation is um, very important. And as I said, you know, the left and the right both uh, missed a mark on this. Um, where again, you know, the left says that you criticize Islam, you're bigoted against all Muslims. And the right says Islam is problematic, so we must demonize all Muslims. Um, and it, the result of that is that on the left, um, you know, you're pretending that Islamic terrorism doesn't exist. It's not even a problem. And on the right, um, you end up calling for bans on Muslims, on all Muslims uh, across across the board. So, so both of those, um, I think these sort of, you know, it's a very polarized world. I mean, we've seen that um, increasing um, in the last uh, few years. And, and now, you know, as you can see with, with Brexit and with the Trump victory, you know, that's kind of come to, you know, point where I, I don't think it's ever been this divided before, um, at least in recent times. And uh, this is the one thing where uh, both sides are missing the mark. So I'd like to see, and I, uh, hopefully this book can trigger discussion about that aspect, about separating the ideas, the ideology uh, from the identity aspect. Yeah, I think um, all bets are off in terms of political predictions for the next 
10 years now. Um, oh, polls. I, I, I don't even know what, what do you go with? Yeah. The polls are just completely, uh, they're, uh, I don't know what pollsters are going to do. I think um, wh- whatever the poll says, it's a good chance that the opposite's true from now on, uh, going on recent performance. Well, I mean, there is a, I wouldn't say a good chance. Like, what's interesting is that if you go to the, you know, Nate Silver's uh, 538 uh, website, um, where he, you know, he he tends to make predictions. He said that there was a seventy five percent chance that uh, Hillary Clinton would win and twenty five percent chance that Trump would win. And going by that, like the odds actually do sort of. That means every four election cycles, or like every sixteen years, you're going to get the unexpected result, which is a, actually quite frequent if you think about it. Yeah. So when you when you look at it that way, they're not completely off. Um, um, you know, I mean, it is consistent with the odds, uh, but just the individual polls that he based that projection on, uh, that's what's problematic about it is that uh, all of these individual polls were completely off. Well, one of the things I really enjoy about your book as well is the way you you address people who lean on this idea of misinterpretation. They'll try and explain away the more odious elements of scripture or the more violent verses and say, well, that's not the original translation or that's only valid for this point in time. I don't Razor Aslan's a master of this kind of obfuscation. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. so, I mean, how, how do you feel about that in terms of, I mean, it would be nicer if they were right, but it you, you don't tend to agree with that um, perspective, do you? Um, no, and I... I mean, it, you you said it. It would be very nice if they were right, um, if that's uh, what it said. But there's this. Uh, we'll, we'll put it this way: it's really interesting that the way that you know Reza Aslan and some of the sort of more recent um, um, uh, moderate uh, Muslims uh, take a look at it is that that their worst nightmare ever, the worst nightmare, <clears throat> is that anybody would read the Quran, the way it's written. Like they will tell you, like, don't read it literally. Whatever you do, do not read this book literally. Like they're terrified of it. And um, when, they, when, when they go on and they start slamming people for reading the book literally, I mean, that's actually quite telling. Um, it terrifies them that people would read the book literally and for good reason, because uh, they know what it looks like and what the words look like when they're actually read. But that, that the problem is, that um, when you're telling people not to do that and to look at the interpretations um, of, of, I guess, their own interpretation, because, you know, and that's what interpretation is. It's a human interpretation. They're essentially telling them to put down the Quran and listen to me, as in to them. You know, they're, they're telling you that. They're like, put down the Quran, forget about the words of God as they're written, but listen to my human interpretation of them. And it would be wonderful if that happened. If you know all the Western Islamic professors, if ISIS and Al Qaeda were actually quoting them, but they're not. They're not quoting Reza Aslan. They're not quoting some professor at uh, Al Azhar University or anywhere else. Uh, they're quoting the Quran. Or they're quoting the Hadith. So, I do think that there is some merit in um, advocating for reinterpretation. Um, as, for instance, as Majid Nawaz does, and Majid Nawaz I think does it very, very well. Um, but, uh, I, uh, ultimately, uh, I, I think that has, there's a barrier to that. You're eventually going to come up and you're going to hit against a wall and you won't be able to get past it. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned Majid Nawaz there cause that's somebody who I, I respect the work he's doing greatly actually, but I'm very skeptical of this idea of reform. I mean, how do you feel about it in general? Is this something you think, has a decent chance of picking up and, and making some real change, or is it um, is it something you're very skeptical of yourself? Um, well, I, I, so Maj and I actually talked about this. Both both of us spoke at the non conference in, in uh, Niagara Falls uh, earlier this year, and we had a panel afterwards. And um, another uh, you know really good friend of mine, Armin Navabi, he's a uh, he's actually the founder of Atheist Republic. And uh, he also did a talk, and his talk was actually against reform. He didn't think that reform was something that would work. And in the panel, Majid talked about, uh, he said that the idea of reform is uh, all-encompassing. It doesn't just include people like me who want to advocate for reinterpretation and um, you know, critically looking at Islam and trying to come up with a new version of it. But it also includes people 
like ex-Muslims um, who, who who want to come up and uh, who want to talk about just atheism or science or skepticism, rationality. He's like, that's all part of uh, the the reform effort. Um, so in that sense, you know, I, I think it's a good thing. Um, when it comes to just when you're just talking purely doctrinally and at an intellectual level, uh, I I don't agree with Majid. He knows that. I know that we you know we we both disagree, and I have the sort of the same view that you do. I think it's very difficult uh, to take these scriptures and some of the things, and you really have to go through an in, an incredible amount of mental gymnastics and acrobatics to uh, sort of twist it into something that fits with our sense of um, modern morality, right? Uh, but from an outreach and a political point of view, uh, or just a, a sort of a, a, a social political point of view, um, I think that it has a lot of merit. I think there are many people, and this is why another reason why the atheist Muslim is something that does resonate. I mean, I, I remember I wrote an article uh, with this phrase in it in 2013, and I got letters from all over, or emails, I guess, <laughs> letters, uh, for, <laughs> all over the um, uh, people in the Muslim world. Um, who really liked the term atheist Muslim. They felt like it described them as contradictory as it is because uh, there are many people who have their doubts, um, but they don't want to step out. They don't want to go out all the way. I mean, one of the big reasons for that is that, you know, rejecting Islam, rejecting yourself as a Muslim in a lot of those places means it has dire consequences, right? So, so they, they kind of keep, want to keep, you know, one foot in, but they do also want to branch out and join the rest of the world. Um, and uh, things like reform or the work that Majid's doing um, actually do appeal to those people. Uh, there are other people who feel that it's cognitively dissonant. You know, you know they can't just uh, marry this idea of, uh, you know, that th this verse actually, uh, or, you know, the, the, the stuff about uh, the Quran with, you know, all of its uh, the verses about uh, women um, you know, marrying that with modern ideas of feminism and somehow making them jive. You know, they, that's something that they don't want to, that they find uh, too much of a challenge um, for their own integrity. And uh, they, you know, they don't want to do that. For them, an approach like what I'm doing and what Armin talks about uh, makes a lot more sense. So I think there is something for everybody. You know, there, there are clearly many, many young Muslims are not going to look at what I'm talking about and immediately embrace it. It's going to be too much for them. It'll be too far for them. But for them, what Majid is talking about may be something that's acceptable. You know, it could, it could trigger they, it's something that they can talk to their parents about. They can tell them that, you know, I like this guy Majid Nawaz. I'm still Muslim. We're still in this. But, you know, maybe it's time to think about the future and where this is going to go. Uh, but, you know, we're not leaving anything. Um, for them, that works. So I, I think different things appeal uh, to different kinds, to, to different people. Um, and I, I think that when it comes to this stuff, it's, it's the reason and rationality are very important. I mean, for me, they're very important. But uh, there's an emotional aspect to it. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, that whole sense of identity. There's, a, there's an irrational aspect, if you will, uh, to it that, uh, that's very important and that drives a lot of decisions in people's lives. So from, from a purely practical point of view, you know, just accepting the fact that we're dealing with human beings here. Um, I, I think that we have to acknowledge it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think one of the, the huge problems here with um, this process, I think comes from non-Muslims and in a way that doesn't really happen with Christianity. It's the, the fact that non-Muslims tend to hold practicing Muslims to a really conservative interpretation themselves the we yeah. this this i mean you mentioned before about the extremes of the left and the right and i think the left this, these last couple of years since we last spoke especially have really fetishized things like the hijab to the point where they're almost being forced in this idea of modesty um we're always looking at um islamists in the news and some non-muslim will write well we've got information to suggest they had some alcohol once or they smoke drugs therefore they're not real muslims it's almost like it's almost like non-muslims are playing the muslim police too a little bit right yeah yeah and uh i i think that that's uh, i i completely agree with you and and a lot of that i think has to do with uh, this idea that um 
Well, actually, a lot of it has to do with whether you know the Muslims are a minority in a society or Muslims are a majority. And and I, I wrote this in the book. I said, you know, in countries uh, where Muslims are a majority, or in uh, sorry, in countries where Muslims are a minority, Islam is an identity. In countries where Muslims are a majority, Islam is a religion. Um, so what you have then is that, uh, say, here in Canada, you know, the, there are many women who choose to wear the hijab. You know, as a symbol of uh, their heritage and their identity, and and especially when there's so much sort of antagonism against uh, against Muslims, you know, they feel like it's really important for them to stand up for uh, their sort of ancestral um, and birth identities, and and they think the hijab represents that. But that same hijab that people here choose to wear as a form of identity over there in Muslim majority countries is uh, used to uh, oppress and subjugate women. Uh, it's forced on them by their governments. Um, it's forced on them by their societies and uh, by, by their husbands and their fathers, right? Um, so you, you have the same thing over here. The Quran is this, uh, it, it's it's revered as it's, it's really more like a symbol. Most people haven't really read it. Uh, they don't know the details about it. They certainly don't know about uh, all of the um the sort of the, the, the analyses and, and, and the depth that uh, the scholars have gone into when it comes to the Quran. Uh, but it's, it's a symbol of their identity, and they have it in their house, and then they keep it there. Uh, and they revere it. But that same Quran is actually opened up, and what the contents of it are actually used, are incorporated in Muslim-majority countries into their constitutions and into their penal codes. And it's used as an excuse to allow men to beat women uh, to allow people to stone uh, women to death for adultery, to allow them to um, uh, kill, apost- execute apostates or flog bloggers like Rife, by the way. Um, so, and you have a whole host of uh, large populations of, of uh, liberal, pro-secular uh, people who are actually fighting against these, uh, these theocratic regimes. And all of them, to some extent, are theocratic. Um, even if they're not officially, you know, fitting in with the textbook definition of the word. I mean, they all incorporate those elements of, of um, uh, the Islamic ideology uh, into uh, their their constitutions and, and the way that they conduct their uh, their governments. Um, and there are people fighting against that. And when they criticize uh, the governments there, you know, we praise them. But the moment those people came here, if Raif Badawi came to Canada or the U.S., and um, voice some of the same ideas that he did in his blog uh, that got him jailed over there, uh, the people would call him Islamophobic. I mean, I've seen this with, uh, uh, you know, myself, with people like Faisal Saeed al-Muttar, who came from Iraq as a refugee. Uh, the same things he was doing there, he was fighting as a liberal over there, a lot of those ideas. The moment he comes here and says them, where Muslims are a minority and they're, and they're seen as a minority that must be protected, uh, by liberals, he's, he's called an Islamophobe by liberals. So I think that that explains a lot of, uh, you know, to why we see this. Um, the same, same people who are sort of canonized as heroes uh, in Muslim majority countries over here are are, are denounced as bigots, um, and it's and they have the same ideas. They're saying the same things, and I think that's very interesting. It has a lot to do with whether Muslims are a minority or a majority in that society or that country. How much do you think that labelling and shutting people down when they raise legitimate concerns about Islam played into the election of Donald Trump? It's a big conversation topic at the moment, how much the failing of the far left led to this, and how much stock do you put in that idea? I I think it's huge. I mean, I I said it uh, several times, I actually even wrote about it um, many, many months ago, um, just the idea that the liberals had an opportunity to tackle the problem of uh, Islamism and Islamic radicalism, as they say, uh, from a position of moral strength and in an honest way. And they didn't do that. They wouldn't even name the issue. They pretended it didn't exist um, or that it had nothing to do uh, with the ideology of Islam. And that left a vacuum left a void and that is something that uh, Donald Trump and the alt-right they ended up um, opportunistically you know exploiting in a really really dark 
divisive, um, xenophobic way, you know, in a very bigoted way. Uh, and uh, it, it could have been different. I, I think that there are similar blind spots um, uh, from the other, other part of the left that had a, that allowed for people like Trump. And Trump is, you know, he's, he's great at this. I mean, his uh, his um, the, the way that he does things is that you know he he knows how to recognize an audience. He knows how to listen to an audience beyond what regular politicians do. He knows what they're kind of talking about, what they're really thinking. And he gives voice to those concerns. And uh, people say, well, you know, I can't really say this, but he's saying exactly what I was thinking. And and he's done this, um, just, you know, recognizing an audience and playing to them and giving them what they want. Uh, you know, he did this with in the Manhattan uh, real estate community, the business elites there. Um, he's done it with uh, the TV audiences, with having like the, a number one show like The Apprentice. Uh, he did it with the uh, Republican primary. He knew what those the Republican base was like, um, and in, in a way that the the establishment was completely shocked. They had no idea that these uh, some of the people in the base actually held these ideas. That you know, when he says, "I want to ban all Muslims," and Paul Ryan comes up and says, "This is not who we are. This is not what Republicans are," and Suddenly, it turns out that is kind of what the Republicans are. They, <laughs> they, they, they did end up. He did get end up getting a lot of popular support, and he surged in the polls after he said that. So, um, he knows things. I mean, he he is good at. Uh, you know, one thing I'll give him credit for is he's definitely good at listening. He can listen to like the Rust Belt, where he ended up winning in Michigan, Wisconsin, and uh, Minnesota. I mean, he didn't win Minnesota, but he could have. I mean, it was very close there. I mean, he actually listened to uh, what concerns people had and uh you know he, he gave them what they wanted so he's he's brilliant at this he's brilliant in finding out where vacuums exist um where uh you know certain elements of the discourse have been sort of left out and so people who've been neglected who feel like nobody's talking to them he's able to fill that void in any way he wants in the way that he thinks will be most beneficial to him yeah, I agree. And it's, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of reaction he gets from Trump voters when I think he may fall short of some of the promises that he's made. I mean, you mentioned there about Muslim uh, immigration specifically and his claims to put a stop to that, as, uh, you know, certainly temporarily. Uh, how likely do you think he is to actually enact a policy like that? I, I... I actually, I, I, you know, the the thing is again, like as you said before, you you can't predict anything. <laughs> so I know there's a, I know there are a lot of people who are saying that, uh, you know, Trump will, you know, he's going to flip flop. He's gone back on the climate change thing. He's gone back on Obamacare. But I think that the only thing that we know for sure about Trump, right, and this is actually something that's encouraging, is that he's willing to listen. He's willing to, if he surrounds, if there are people who are around him who kind of stroke his ego in the right way and who he feels are loyal to him and who he can trust, um, he will listen to them. And uh, it's not even uh, an ideological thing. I mean, he'll listen to people who are, uh, who are liberal. You know? And that's what, one of the things, that, one of the first times I thought of this was when he had that meeting with uh, Obama. And I think Obama is one of the only people who has hit the right tone on this. You know, he's... Uh, I mean, this is a guy, he's, he has no idea what to do as president. He's never been a politician. He's, he's obviously exceedingly unqualified uh, to be president. So he's there. He's, his, the only thing he could do, as any of us would do if we were in his position, is that we would surround ourselves with people and be like, okay, tell me what to do. You know? and, I, and you'd want to surround yourself with people who are, are qualified uh, in these different areas. So uh, it would actually be good for liberals to go up and to form relationships with him rather than shutting him out, which is what they're doing now, you know, like throwing labels out and whatever you think of him and go up to him, approach him and say that, Hey, you know, there are ways I can help you. And that's what Obama did. And Joe Biden did as well. And, um, just today there was a report, um, the Kellyanne Conway, you know, his uh, chief strategist for his, uh, uh, campaign. She came up and he said, he's been talking to Obama periodical, uh, periodically and Obama made the outreach that, uh, you know, he actually reached out and, uh, tried to communicate with him and, uh, it's working. And he has talked about how he might, he's open to the climate change uh, agreement from Paris. He's, he's open to keeping parts of, uh, uh Obama's, uh, healthcare, 
um, proposal and or healthcare law. So he's uh, he seems to be uh, that, that approach does seem to be working. I think more and more liberals should probably do it. So I but I don't I don't think that that means that he's going to flip flop on everything. I just think that it means that uh, he is influenceable. You know, if you get close enough and you give him the right things and you approach him the right way, you know, he is the kind of guy who will probably, uh, he's not ideological in that sense, but he is, um, you know, he'll listen to ideas if he thinks they're coming from people who genuinely respect him, tend or pretend to respect him. <laughs> okay, well... <laughs> Certainly hope you're right about that. I um I wanted to switch the conversation to something far more cheery now, um, which is anti Semitism. Yeah. Uh, Wonderful, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think what becomes clear if you engage enough um with the Muslim world and listening and you speak to ex Muslims a lot, it's this this feeling that you you basically, you know, a lot of Muslim communities just drink anti Semitism in the water, it seems commonplace. And mm-hmm. there's this wonderful anecdote you tell in your book, uh, you're working a summer job, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correct, and you you, right. you you wouldn't even I don't even think you'd consider yourself anti Semitic at the time, but just having an interaction with somebody who let it be known they were Jewish kind of made this residual thing that had been ingrained in you, you know, bubble to the surface a little bit. I was wondering maybe you could tell me a little bit what that's like and, and where it comes from from a scriptural standpoint. Well, it's um so let's talk about that incident first. So the, the context of that was uh, when I was ten years old, I was in the fifth grade or eleven, ten, eleven. You know, we had an we had an assignment where, um, and, I, and I begin the book with this anecdote is where a teacher wanted us to make snowflakes uh, out of paper. You know, you do that as a kid. You fold up a piece of paper, you cut it up, and you know, you open it up, and there's a snowflake, and you know, you decorate it with glue and glitter and so on. So, you know, we did that, and she put them up on on the bulletin board. Like every kid had a snowflake with their name on it, and um, this is in Saudi Arabia. It's the American International School in Saudi Arabia, so that's why you know we we did a lot of these sort of activities. But uh, the Ministry of Education would usually send somebody around once in a while to do a spot check to make sure that everything was still compliant uh, with um, Saudi law. As in, you know, you were saying winter instead of Christmas, and um, you know, you, you weren't talking about any any of the religious stuff. We were just sticking to you know the fun, uh, traditional Santa Claus and trees and uh, that kind of thing. So he comes in, he does this project. He asks the teacher. He uh, he looks at uh, the the snowflakes and he starts scowling. And then he asks the teacher for a pair of scissors and he goes ahead and he cuts one point off of each snowflake. And we're all confused. We're all you know 10, 11 year old kids in a classroom. We're like you know what is he doing and. Uh, he just kind of huffed and puffed, uh, and he left. And now we had these sort of five-pointed snowflakes on the board because six points were, of course, the Star of David. The teacher, unfortunately for her, had to explain this to us. And, you know, we're all kids from a whole bunch of different countries. There were no Saudis in the school because they weren't allowed to um, attend foreign schools. And um, that's how I found out what the Jews were. And it was terrifying. It's like there was, like, this is something, even a snowflake was a threat um, to them. So, uh, th- this idea of the, of the Jews just seemed, uh, you know, I, I went home and asked my, my father about it and he pulled out uh, a world map to show me to, to talk about Israel and, uh, and tell me how about, you know, the, the history of the Jews and so on and that, and the Muslims and how they'd gotten along before and how they don't get along now and, and so on. And, um, when, uh, he showed it to me, Israel actually did not exist on the map. It was a notch in the Mediterranean. It was just part of, uh, uh, it was just blue, just like the rest of the Mediterranean. It was a little notch into the land. So um, that was my introduction to Jews. And this was just a spot check that happened on one day. And uh, you'd see little things like this in the society from time to time. And again, this is Saudi Arabia. And so... You know, but I, I always thought that, and I'm like, okay, well, they're wrong. You know, my parents, I'm, I'm educated. My parents are educated. You know, they raise me differently. We're not like the rest of these guys. You know, we think differently. You know, we're more uh, liberal. We're more progressive. Yet, uh, when I came out and I was in Canada, and I was doing that summer job at the convenience store, and uh, I met a, a guy who I was having a conversation with, just a regular conversation. Um, and then later he just happened to tell me that he was from Israel. I had this really involuntary fight or flight reaction. 
it, it was just mentally, I, I, I closed down, uh, you know, I became sort of very, uh, d- I sort of it, it just, I felt my palms getting clammy and, you know, it, it was just a very strange reaction that surprised me. And uh, because intellectually, like just mentally, I knew that this is not something that was a problem, but the way that it, it creeps into your subconscious over the years when it, it's ingrained in you. Uh, it made me react that way. And I had all these strange thoughts going through my head. I'm like, but I love Woody Allen. I mean, those are the kinds of things I was, <laughs> I'm like, Woody Allen, Einstein was great. You know, I was my, he's my hero. And uh, so it was, it was really, really bizarre. And I was trying to talk myself out of the reaction, but it was, it was almost involuntary. And that actually made me think about this idea of choice. You know, no matter if you're raised in a place like that, even if you, um, see these anti-Semitic, um, you know, things around you from time to time, even if it's occasional and, and uh, you don't agree with you, are just exposed to them. They can have a pretty devastating effect on you. Um, and to think that for me, I just experienced a spot check from that guy from the Ministry of Education, but uh, a lot of the Saudi kids, the locals there, I mean, they're raised. I mean, the people, the guy who did the spot check and cut off the tips of the snowflakes, he actually writes the curriculum. And he has a team that writes the textbooks for these kids that they read day in and day out. Right. So my exposure was uh, infinitesimal compared to um, what those kids have. I mean, they grow up with it. So it really makes you wonder, you know, how. Uh, you know, when they do come around, when you deal with them, when you talk to them, simply talking to them rationally, this is, you know, what we were talking about earlier, is talking to them rationally and saying that, you know, that this is not how it is. I mean, do we, is that enough to counter that level of, um, I guess, indoctrination about ideas like this? Or uh, do you have to do something else? So it's a, you know, that's a question that I've been wondering about for decades now. And I write about it in the book too. And where, where does the the scriptural justification come in for this kind of animosity or distrust of the Jews in in general? Well, I mean, in the in the, uh, the, the there's a historical aspect to it, and this is you know you got you got to remember that Muhammad throughout his lifetime, the Quran actually came down in fragments, so uh, the, the verses came down over a period of of decades, actually, um, starting when he was uh, forty years old. So. There, there was a war that they fought in uh, when he ran from Mecca to Medina. He was forced out of Mecca because he was essentially blaspheming against. He was doing what I do, you know, in a way. I follow <laughs> the example of the Prophet. In a lot of ways, he was he was just upsetting uh, the status quo and uh, the Quraysh and the pagans and uh, the people who lived in Mecca. Um, they didn't like him. They thought he was a threat. They chased him out of Mecca. He went to Medina, uh, which is you know another the second holiest city. Uh, for Muslims. At that time, it was called Yathrib, and it was, uh, it was run by Jews. And he made a treaty with the Jews. And then there was a war between him and the Meccans, and the Jews kind of, uh, they sided with the Quraysh. Apparently, they didn't like him a whole lot. Um, that caused a lot of issues for him. That's after that, he actually, you know, he uh, d- d- beheaded a whole bunch of them for treason, and their, uh, their, their wives and their children were taken into slavery. Um, and the, you know, there's a very famous incident that you know people do try to uh, sort of hide from the public, uh, especially Muslims, even though it's a, it's pretty much accepted throughout Shia Sunni everybody. So Saudi Arabia, they don't have to hide it as much. They actually talk about it. They teach it in schools. They teach it as a great thing. This is the punishment for treason. That happens. There's a lot of verses in the Quran that deal with it. There are those that say that, you know, the Jews uh, describe the, the Jews and Christians as apes and swines and, and apes and swine in Surah 5 verse 51 says, don't take the Jews and Christians for your friends. Uh, even in places that are actually conciliatory and nice uh, to Jews and Christians, where it says that, you know, if there are Jews and Christians, you can, you know, be nice to them. Some of those verses they actually uh, refer to when you look at it contextually. Now we're talking about context. Uh, they refer to people who used to be Jews and Muslims before they converted, okay, before they accept the word of Allah. Okay. So um, because of that, there's a lot of scriptural basis to it. And that kind of gives it, uh, a, it, gives it a more um, lasting effect uh, so that even it's, it's much harder to change 
um, any kind of backward behavior when you have divine endorsement for it. You know, like if I uh, was supposing, you know, child marriage is uh, acceptable at some point in history. And it was in not only here, in all cultures. I mean, slavery was accepted. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, the man who wrote the words, all men are created equal, uh, was a slave owner. And also um, when he in his 40s, he had uh, sex with his 14 year old slave and then uh, would ultimately have six of his children. So but we give him a pass because uh, nobody to this day is claiming that Jefferson was divine. And nobody to this day is defending his actions and saying, well, no, he was right to own slaves because at that time it was, you know, and so no, nobody's doing that. Um, but uh, with uh, Muhammad, the problem is that a lot of that has divine endorsement. So a lot of his actions um, are still justified and defended uh, by, by many people, by many Muslims, uh, because uh, he's the perfect example of all time. Saudi Arabia is like that. And that's, that's where the, uh, the, the the anti-Semitic attitudes actually get divine endorsement from the Quran, and there's uh, when you when you have that, when you have issues, when you have uh, taboos and like blasphemy and apostasy and blasphemy and apostasy, when those things are crimes, you can't even advance the conversation beyond a certain point. You can have a debate in Riyadh, like okay, let's bring in people, let's talk about being nice to Jews, and they'll have that whole conversation. Then at one point, someone will say something about the Quran, the Hadith. And uh, the history and how what Muhammad said about it, and then you can't argue that because once you argue it, you're blaspheming. Um, so, so there are the scriptural basic scripture essentially provides a conversational barrier. It's a way to win an argument without really winning an argument. Yeah. Okay. So the the book it's been a long time coming, but it's been out about less than a week now. I think I'm right in saying. Yeah. And obviously, this kind of book's always going to invite some level of unwanted attention. I was just wondering if you had any time to absorb some of the reaction yet, any of the crazier elements as well as the praise? Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I've I've seen a few things. I mean, there there have been some, uh, most of the reviews that have come out so far, um, which have been just a handful, have been great. Um, there was one review that was uh, um, in the Globe and Mail uh, that was not as... Uh, flattering that found it to be that was uh, critical of a lot of aspects of it um, I think that all of those reviews are worth reading like I obviously I, I don't agree with it I think that uh, there's a, 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 I have a whole chapter in this book called Islamophobia phobia and the regressive left uh, that um, attacks in a sense you know what we were talking about with the left uh, the liberal left and I still identify mostly when it comes to most issues, I, I'm a liberal myself. But this is one thing I've been disappointed with. So I, I've, I've noticed that a lot of people who are um, of that persuasion, who are sort of liberal left, will, will tend to uh, be more critical of it. They're saying you're laying all the blame for all of Donald Trump's bigotry and everything on the left. And, and that's not what the book's about. So um, I, I think that uh, you know, there, there has been reaction. There's definitely a conversation going. People are talking about the title. Uh, and I think it's interesting, but as you said, it's it's just been under a week, so we'll, we'll kind of see where it goes from here. What, what do you think the Southern Poverty Law Center will make of it? I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> you mean based on precedent? You know, I mean, just, just by the fact that people like Majid Nawaz have found themselves added to a list of anti-Muslim extremists this last month or so? It's it's an attempt to shame them into silence. Uh, that's really what it is. I, I, I mean, the people, this whole idea that, you know, when we're talking about using labels, like uh, when your best argument is, oh, you're a racist, you're a bigot, or you're an extremist, and that's the only thing you can say in response to an argument, then that's not really a counter-argument. It's a, um, excuse me, it's a, it's just a lazy substitute for one. And you know, I write. I write in the book. I say that uh, in Pakistan, you know, they had blasphemy laws uh, to force us into silence, and over here they have smears of Islamophobia um, to shame us into it. And and the purpose is really the same: uh, is to quiet people who are critical of this ideology because they they think that uh, again the left considers any criticism of uh, the ideology to be bigoted. I mean, if uh, you if the KKK manifesto says um, something about homosexuals or, you know, Donald Trump says something about, about women, you know, we're outraged by it. But the moment you take those same things that they say 
and uh, they're from the Quran um, or even from the Bible, suddenly you have to stand back and you have to respect it because it's someone's belief. And that's not what liberalism is. Liberalism is supposed to be if, if there is an idea that you're against, uh, then you should be against it across the board. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, there was a um, tragic murder of a politician in our country not so long ago. Um, Joe Cox, she was called Labour politician. Right, yes. Yeah, killed by a neo-Nazi, Thomas Mayer. Um, he's been obviously tried as a terrorist and, and, and dealt with in that manner. Um, but one of the newspapers in this country, the Daily Mail, which is, it's, got, it's, it's a pretty awful newspaper, they tried to make excuses or at least legitimise excuses for him in, in the way that they amplified it as a, you know he had some grievances they were saying that he was scared of losing his house and the politician had rejected calls to speak to him and blah 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 and the left in this country absolutely exploded with rage that anyone would dare make excuses for this neo-nazi and, and i think they're absolutely right but i think right. the uh, uh the hypocrisy meter kind of exploded at the same time yeah yeah, it is because I mean they, that's the kind of thing they did with Charlie Abdo. Yes, exactly, precisely the same. So I mean, I, I share this disappointment with my fellow liberals and lefties that you do, and it just seems that like this is the one area where they forget their liberal values for a moment and completely drop the ball. Yeah, I mean they they have done that in the past too, and I, I think that uh, this, uh, you know, the whole left and the right, and the left says this, the right says this. I, I think that this is going to be history really soon. Yes. Um, I, I actually heard uh, Stephen Schmidt, who is who was an advisor to John McCain's campaign in 2008, and he he apparently actually also helped prep Sarah Palin for the debates. So you can imagine that after the election was over, he came out with uh, you know a lot of uh, you know he basically wrote you know, sort of a tell all had a sort of tell all episode where he completely railed against her. Uh, he's a very smart guy, and he said something about how. In the past, there was a, uh, and he said this before the election, he said in the past there was a, a vertical line on which, you know, you had uh, liberal ideology and you had conservative ideology. And it was an ideological divide, you know, between the two. But now there's more of a horizontal line. It's uh, people who have benefited from the tech revolution and um, it's taken them forward and people who have been left behind uh, from it. And he, he predicted, he said that, you know, these states like Wisconsin and uh, Michigan, where um, that actually eventually went to Trump, he says you're going to see more of those uh, go Republican because the the whole dialogue is changing, and I I kind of uh, I, I feel that way just generally with the left and right. I, I think that the way that um, people think now is very different. I I don't. When I when I look at the left, I I I think that they've been wrong on so many things. I mean, they've been wrong on communism. We've seen that with the whole Fidel Castro death. I mean, it's been ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Like even the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau here in Canada, who I like, I, I actually really like him and I and I support him other otherwise, and I I voted for him too uh, for his party. But um, it's just so disappointing to see a statement like that. You know, come from him, and you know, while the left is uh, the, the right's hypocritical too, because they're going to slam Trudeau for his statement. But if you look at how uh, they suck up to Saudi Arabia <laughs> and all the effusive praise that came after King Abdullah's death, you know, um, th th that's also it's essentially the same thing. So it's actually I'm, it's very disappointing to see you know what's happening on both sides because there is name calling. Uh, you know, you're doing this. No, you're doing this. And it, it's, they're both kind of, you know, doing the same thing in a way. The discourse is, is very – the discourse is very similar. Um, that by no means – I mean, that, that doesn't mean that, say, you know, Hillary Clinton and Trump were pretty much the same. There was no difference. I, mean, I don't want to – I want to make sure I make that distinction. But I do feel like the discourse of uh, name-calling um, and just the sheer lack of – argumentation and just the neglect of reason as an element in making your case um, is an epidemic now on both sides. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, just for my last question then, I suppose, would you, well, I mean, I mean it might not be in your hands, but can you ever see uh, a version in Arabic of your book being published at all? I, I've already had people write to me, and uh, there, there are people who've read the book, and they want to do Arabic translations. I've had somebody ask me uh, if they can do a Bengali translation. Um, so I, I would ideally, 
want to see that. Um, the, the goal is to, you know, with time, uh, have this translated in uh, Urdu, Bengali, um, Farsi, Arabic, uh, and a lot of these languages uh, in Muslim majority countries. And I just have to figure out how to go about that. Uh, you know, sort of work out the details with the publisher and so on to see how we can do it. But it's absolutely something I 100% committed to doing. I mean, the number one uh, reason I wrote this book, the audience for this are, you know, the, the thousands of uh, the young uh, closeted secularists and atheists and agnostics and humanists uh, that have written to me over the last seven or eight years from, uh, from Malaysia, from Saudi Arabia, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh. Um, that's who the book is for. That's who it's uh, directed to. And so it would be, I mean, I'd absolutely, like this was, uh, uh, you know, it is as much of a goal as writing the book itself is to have it translated in languages uh, where people could read it there. Excellent. Well, I really hope that happens and that I've really enjoyed speaking to you again. And like I said, I, I absolutely love the book. Can't recommend it enough. It's just kind of a perfect balance of, you know, personal history and personal story, and it's mixed with, you know, right up to date uh, topics, things that are really pertinent to the discussion right now, really, as well. So uh, I'm happy to pimp that out whenever anybody speaks to me about it. I think you've done an excellent job. Uh, thank you very much. And I just want to tell uh, anybody listening to this I mean, the people do ask if. Um, how they can get their hands on it in other countries, like in, in a lot of the Muslim majority countries I'm talking about. And I just want to let them know that uh, there is an audio version of it that's been narrated by Neil Shah, and uh, he's done an amazing job. Uh, they, can, they can get their hands on that, or they can get their hands on the ebook, uh, which you can get on uh, not only for your Kindle, but also uh, on iTunes and iBooks. Uh, you can get the ebook version there too, as well as the audio. So, uh, if you can't get your hands on the print copy, uh, you can still read the book through those channels. All right, Ali, thank you very much for speaking to me again. Yeah, you too. No, thank you. It was really good to speak to you again. Thank you very much to my excellent guest, Ali Rizvi, and thank you for listening. Think we've all learned something here today? <laughs>